time in the history of Benedictine College and the culture. The vision to transform culture in America has energized the college and its students. And part of that vision to transform culture is the emphasis on beauty. In 2017, Bishop Robert Barron was in Kansas to receive the Lumen Vitae Award from St. Benedict's Abbey. And at that ceremony, Bishop Barron said, when you start with the beautiful, it's more winsome. It awakens less defensiveness among people. We evangelize through the beauty of our tradition. We took these words to heart and started the Center for Beauty and Culture. This center is a crucial initiative of our new strategic plan, Transforming Culture in America. Benedictine College's mission to educate men and women within a community of faith and scholarship commits the college to the same transformative work of the first Benedictines who saved civilization from darkness and set the world ablaze after the fall of the Roman Empire. Likewise, when German immigrants found themselves out on the plains of Kansas on the brink of the Civil War with no one to provide for their spiritual needs, it was the Benedictines who answered the call to educate and shepherd them, leading to the founding of St. Benedict's Abbey, Mount St. Scholastica Monastery, and Benedictine College. Today, we are again living in a time of cultural crisis, and again, Benedictine's mission will transform culture in America by modeling community in an age of incivility, spreading faith in an age of hopelessness, and committing to scholarship in a post-truth era. But in all of this, it is crucial that we remember what Bishop Barron told us, start with the beautiful. One of the main priorities of the new strategic plan is to extend the mission of the college by providing our unique formation in community faith and scholarship to off-campus audiences. The Center for Beauty and Culture promotes and employs the dynamic power of God's beauty as a tool for evangelization in our times. The Center offers the inherited wisdom of the Catholic Church as a partner in dialogue with artists, architects, musicians, writers, and all who make the message of Christ and his church appealing and delightful. This interdisciplinary center gives students the tools to integrate the beauty of God's plan for creation into their studies, brings intellectual and artistic leaders to campus, and reaches beyond the campus borders through inspiring and entertaining videos and programming. One of the key players helping us do this is Dr. Jason Baxter, Interim Director of the Center for Beauty and Culture. Dr. Baxter came on board as the center's Interim Director this fall. He leads and manages the center's programming and initiatives writes uh, prolifically, and is currently working on a translation of Dante's Divine Comedy. Dr. Baxter holds a doctorate in literature from the University of Notre Dame, and prior to joining Benedictine, he spent time as a visiting associate professor at Notre Dame, preceded by 12 years at Wyoming Catholic College. As we turn our attention to this special award ceremony, please welcome Dr. Jason Baxter. President Menes, the man for whom this prize is named, Fra Angelico O.P., spent a good portion of his life working with a team of painters to make frescoes for a Dominican priory in Florence by the name of San Marco. The team created images in the refectory, in individual cells, for the altar, in the hallways, over the stairs, over the doors. It was the most extensively decorated Dominican house in the 200-year history of the order. But you wouldn't call it lavish or luxurious because the images rarely portray more than one or two figures. Mary demurely bending before the angel, Christ swaying away from Mary Magdalene, Dominic broken-hearted clinging to the foot of the cross. In other words, Fra Angelico did something amazing. He made images that were quiet, authentic, and simple. Images whose beauty lies in the pursuit of holiness, a holiness that is expressed in heartfelt and simple gesture. Mr. Cody Swanson, like Fra Angelico, a Florentine, even if in the medium of sculpture as opposed to painting, has dedicated himself to the recovery of figural art and a renewal of Renaissance and Baroque forms in contemporary sacred art both as an artist and as an educator. Mr. Swanson believes, quoting in one of his articles, the beauty of all things in the world lay in proportion, the origin of which may be said is divine, for it derives from the body of Adam and was not only made by the divine hands of God, 
but shaped in his image and likeness. To this end, the American-born and Italian-trained Mr. Swanson was one of the founding faculty members of the Sacred Art School in Florence, and he now operates a private studio in the same city. He's fulfilled commissions both in the US and in Italy, collaborating with architects Duncan Stroik and James McCreary, the latter of whom designed our new library, as well as sculpting for the monastery of, of the American Benedictines in Norcia, Italy. Among the old masters Mr. Swanson particularly admires, he tells me, Bernini. And of all the things in the world he's most proud of, after his family, is the Fatima Group, which he just had installed in Wichita. And perhaps even more excitingly, he's going to design for us the medallion which we will award to future winners of this prize. And so on behalf of the Center for Beauty and Culture, I'd like to award the 2023 Benedictine College Prize for Excellence in Theology and the Arts to Mr. Cody Joseph Swanson of Florence, Italy. Thank you so much. Uh, many thanks to Paul, to Jason, uh, and to President Stephen uh, Minnis. Uh, I'm so honored to be here and humbled to receive this award from such a wonderful and distinguished Catholic school in our nation. As an artist, uh, it, is an also, it is also an honor to have been tasked with developing the medallion which will be given to future recipients of the award. Uh, when approaching a design for the image given to Center's devotion to Beato Angelico, who was a Dominican and painter, I was reminded of the legend that he wept profusely every time he painted the, painted the crucifixion, as depicted here in this uh, 19th century painting by Hippolyte Flandrin on the left. Uh, we believe in powers and principalities and that angels are involved in human affairs. So after looking at other references, such as the uh, miraculous girding of St. Thomas Aquinas by Velasquez, uh, the thought came to show Beato Angelico himself overcome while, paint, while uh, painting a crucifix in an inner chamber and being attended by an angel. Uh, the underlying idea of this composition is that his labor and devotion is born out of love for Christ and in service of the church, which is perhaps the most important reason why someone would be honored with this award. Uh, it is also a depiction of humble self abandon for Christ, who is our center and center of this image. The lettering is from the Vulgate of Matthew 16.25, he that shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for, 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 to everyone at Benedictine. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Theology versus ideology and stylistic stratification, an argument for continuity in classical Christian tradition. To continue on the topic of angels, as Catholics, we worship and adore a living triune God, and he has many choirs of angels who act as his attendants and messengers. On Ponte Sant'Angelo of Rome, we are confronted with these remarkable otherworldly figures holding the instruments of the passion of our Lord, who prepare us in procession for union with the suffering, suffering Christ. Despite being carved in heavy static marble, their material form appears spiritual and incorporeal, with drapery movements resembling a burning flame, all of which remind us of their proximity to the Heavenly Father. These are utterly unique works, but are they merely a dated whimsical expression of the style and fashion of the 17th century? or were they designed with deep spiritual and theological continuity with art of the early Christian church and informed by antiquity? I would argue the latter, and there's a striking resemblance between the early, between the early Christian mosaics of the fifth century from the Basilica of Saints Cosmas and Damian and the Church of Saint Santa Maria and Dominica in Rome. Notice the linear clarity and bold wisp of drapery forming a sort of tail along with the curvilinear gesture with rectilinear folds. We see this again in the angel from Santa Maria del Popolo after Bernini by Arrigo Ghiarde, and along with the similarity of these Roman copies of Greek Hellenistic works in the Vatican Museums, the flowing drapery is remarkable, remarkably similar. Here is a work of my own I would like to present, which I just completed for the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in Wichita. The subject is the Angel of Fatima, together with Saints Francisco, Jacinta, and Blessed Lucia. Uh, obviously, we're not in the 17th century, so why would anybody attempt, attempt to sculpt this way today? The composition was approached in theological continuity with intent to again represent a fiery immaterial being who dwells in light inaccessible while emphasizing the divine action of this event. 
The angel appeared to these shepherd children in 1916 to prepare them for reception of the host and for their encounter with Our Lady, communicating designs of mercy upon them and inciting them to prayer. The iconography was strictly based upon the writings of Blessed Lucia, who described the angel as appearing after a strong wind with bright light and his drapery resembling a brilliant diamond. And I heard you have a little bit of wind in Kansas as well. How can cloth be carved and look like diamond? It cannot be smooth or generalized, so I attempted to delineate movements with multifaceted folds. The projection of light is also associated with fire, which in this case is represented with curvilinear rhythms, suggesting the liveliness of burning flames. Puring, purifying fire in reference to angels in the divine presence of our Lord has great precedence in scriptures and tradition. Ezekiel detailed his visions of living creatures moving among, among burning coals of fire. Paul states in Corinthians, which is considered a description of purgatory, that he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. And of course, there is Moses in the burning bush, which burned but did not consume. Furthermore, St. John of Damascus writes of angels that God brought them out of nothing into being an incorporeal race of immaterial fire. He makes his ministers a flame of fire. This is also what I sought to convey with this tabernacle angel from the Church of St. Catherine of Siena in Trumbull, Connecticut, with real gold emphasizing proximity to the Lord, as Bernini did with his angel in St. Peter's Basilica. For this subject, it should be stressed the necessity for idealization, as these are clearly not meant to resemble an ordinary person. According to Blessed Lucia's account, the angel also did not have wings, presenting a challenge to render the angel recognizable, reinforcing the necessity for theological grounding to help the viewer differentiate between an angel or an ordinary adolescent. This is also clarified by the comparatively more naturalistic depiction of, depiction of the children, which was based upon historical photographs to represent their individual physiognomy. This is another work currently in progress. This is another work currently in progress depicting Mary, mother of Paris, love for a new shrine in Los Angeles. The title was taken directly from the prophecy of the Virgin Mary in Sirach. I am the mother of fairest love, of fear, of knowledge, and of holy hope. Ego sum mater pucre dilectionis. Styles, isms, and categorization often imply something superficial. So again, how is the construction actually re related to theology? As Catholics, we recognize that she is Panagia, all holy, and as stated in the catechisms, a completely unique member of the church, mother of Christ and mother of the church. We also recognize that she was a creature and therefore isn't, div isn't divine, but she was preserved from original sin to bear our savior. And so doing so, she cooperated with the divine will of the heavenly father by her own volition. So given our beliefs, it makes sense that she should not look like an ordinary individual from the street because she's Theotokos, mother of the living God. For our portrayal of the Lord, the church teaches that he is naturally son of the father as to his divinity and naturally son of his mother as to his humanity. This can be hard to balance in a work of art. Here his hand is upraised in blessing, re representing his divine nature as a sort of little pantocrator, similar to this mosaic from the Duomo of Monreale, while the tender hand upon his mother's represents his human nature. Likewise, in this sculpture of Ave Regina Pacis, I sculpted a tender embrace between our queen and little king. This work was produced for the parish of Our Lady Queen of Peace in Mandeville, Louisiana, and the twist of the child Jesus recalls the Med Medici Madonna of San Lorenzo, in which Michelangelo surprisingly turned the Christ child away from the viewer encouraging us to implore for her intercession that we may see her son, himself our peace. With regards to theology and forming construction, there are a few other examples. This is Our Lady of Cana and fired clay that I made for St. Dominic's Priory of London, which again underlines her intercessory role in the first public miracle of Jesus with a gesture that implies, do whatever he tells you. This depicts uh, another uh, work of Mary Mother Ferris love for the University of Itzmo in Guatemala. Uh, she's shown young and idealized because of her preservation from original sin. This is my wife and children with Sedi Sapiente for Campus Duomedico in Rome. Uh, she is the seed of wisdom and he, made, he is the word made flesh, which is symbolized by the prayer book they hold together. This is a Madonna and child with a goldfinch for the Benedictine Monastery of Norcia. The goldfinch is a bird which loves thorny thistles and foreshadows the thorns and passion in, of our Lord. This is also a reference to, this wonderful, to these wonderful sculptures by Andrea Sansovino in the Santa Agostino of Rome, very beautiful sculptures. This is a painting uh, by, San, by Giovanni Battista Gaoli, otherwise known as Baciccio, who was a protege of Bernini, showing Christ held up above a broken pedestal that forms an altar, again foreshadowing his sacrifice and triumph over the pagan religion. I attempted to make use of this concept in the alabaster relief uh, 
uh, for the N Nevada University Clinic of Madrid. Julia Romano, who was Raphael's pupil, uh, represents this team again of Triumph of Christ over the Ruins of Paganism, which is on our left. And the Raphael on the right is also a very similar and beautiful painting from the Prado. Now, I, I, it should be stated that I don't consider my own work, which I'm showing to be successful, I'm still trying to learn and improve, but we can likely agree that these works of these past masters, such as this Transfiguration by Raphael, are remarkable and truly universal. This large panel, for, which was produced for San Pietro Montorio, was his crowning work, and Bernini went so far as to say that all art should be measured by Raphael. So how and why was this kind of art produced? The Renaissance, as we call it today, literally means rebirth, a rebirth of the grandeur of antiquity in the light of Christ. The artists of this golden age reached the highest summit of art when honoring God and the saints, grounded upon sound theology to inform their, the observation of nature and study the ancients, which was in contrast to the, the pagans who placed their hope in false idols. Around the time of Michelangelo's death uh, in 1564, there was, however, a period of considerable artistic decline. The Florentine Mannerists, as Vasari called them, produced contorted figures leaning toward uh, pagan humanism with moral and iconographic ambiguity. The historian Bellori also described the Mannerists as having abandoned observation to rely only upon their observation, uh, 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 abandoned observation only to rely upon their imagination, much of which contributed to the necessity for this declaration of the Council of Trent, that there be nothing that is unbecoming or confusedly arranged, nothing that is profane, nothing indecorous, seeing that holiness becometh the house of God. Another Christian movement then emerged uh, as a second renaissance of sorts with the aid, aid of the Con Council of Trent and completely connected to the Counter-Reformation. Uh, Rubens, who was born shortly after the death of Michelangelo in 1577, came from a Flemish background with a Calvinist father in a provincial, appre uh, provincial apprenticeship. By his own virtue, he pursued the study of antiquity in the works of Raphael through the etchings of Mercantino Raimondi to bring us the bold vitality of his own Catholic expression. Here's a beautiful immaculate conception by Rubens and a very powerful four evangelists in Sarasota. These four evangelists were the primary influence for my own four evangelists in the Jesuit high school of Tampa, particularly the St. John with the outstretched arm. Uh, much credit is also owed to the three brothers, Agostino, Ludovico, and especially Annibali Caracci of Bologna as they were essential contributors to the second rebirth. This is a beautiful Pietà by Annibali Caracci in the Capo di Monte of Naples. Along with being great artists, the Karachi were studious and well-traveled and formed the first Italian art academy, which taught an eclectic and tasteful balance. Bernini, who was 40 years younger than Annibale Karachi, was a great admirer and stated that his works combined the grace and draftsmanship of Raphael, the knowledge and anatomy of Michelangelo, the nobility of Correggio, the coloring of Titian, and the fertile imagination of Giulio Romano and Andrea Mantegna. So clearly they were taking the best from all the greatest artists to develop their own mature and original works based upon sound classical principle. Here's a print by Ludovico Caracci after the 16th century painter Tintoretto. You can see the influence this high Renaissance work had on the artists of the 17th century. Uh, incredible continuity as well that defies stratification and looks even like what we would call Baroque. These works of St. Matthew and St. Luke are by one of their students, Domenichino, and his pursuit of continuity, for continuity, what did novelty mean at the time? Their contemporary, another great painter, Nicholas Poussin, stated of Domenichino that novelty in painting does not consist pr primarily in the subject that has never been seen, but in good and novel arrangement and expression. And in this way, a subject that was commonplace and stale becomes singular and new. This immaculate conception is the work of their greatest student, Guido Reni, and this is my own feeble attempt of the same subject. With regard to ide idealization and original sin, Rennie's methods were heavily influenced by the rich theological content of this theme. By her obedience, Our Lady, the second Eve, who was preserved from original sin, holds her womb to convey the purpose of her immaculate conception, to bear our Redeemer. She crushes the head of the serpent as mediatrix in the triumph of her sin. This theology is also crystal clear in this Bacciccio, showing Christ as the second Adam and Mary as the second Eve, with the apple and serpent. Again, idealization, idealization versus naturalism is not a dated, stylistic whim of the time. Sin is associated with imperfection, aging, and death, all of which entered the world through the disobedience of Adam and Eve. This was also well understood by Cervantes, who wrote in Don Quixote that art may not surpass nature, but it brings it to perfection. 
In our contemporary world, the communist, Masonic, egalitarian Madonna, who looks like she could work in the grocery store, may seem original to the modern supporters of this trend, but it actually isn't a new idea and has been rejected before for all the same reasons. Phidias, for example, who was acclaimed as a sculptor of the gods by the ancient Greeks by virtue of his ideal harmonies, even though he hadn't seen Jove, uh, while Polycletus was forever the sculptor of athletes for his, work more, his work's more somatic presence. Demetrius of the 5th century BC was accused of being too naturalistic, while Proclus confirms in his commentary on Timaeus that a figure formed by nature is less excellent than another formed by the sculptor, which is why Zeuxis used five virgins for one image of the Helen of Troy. Bernini elaborates upon this in his address to the Royal Academy in Paris when he told the students they must study in Rome and should possess plaster casts of all of the best works from antiquity as examples to help form an idea of beauty, which would serve them their whole life. He also said if they were to study, nat study only nature directly, they would be ruined because, in his own words, nature is always feeble and lacks strength and beauty. Artists who study it should be skilled in recognizing its faults and correcting them, something which students who lack grounding from antiquity cannot do. Now, we also know from the historian Bellori that Guido Reni absolutely loved this, this second century Niobide group from by Scopas, which is now the Uffizi, and developed his own classical ideal based upon this proportional harmony. Looking at Reni's work, it is clear that he was far from copying or imitating the past by following in his footsteps as an, an artist is no longer entirely dependent upon the observation of one individual or simply mimicking what they see, but rather with invention they can produce new works, originally yet connected to the past, through principles as established and confirmed by the ancients with centuries of practice at, at its foundation. Now, with regards to chrono uh, chronology, for the sake of comparison, here's another immaculate conception by Federico Barocci and another one by Baciccio. Now, there are con concepts of historical evolution in which an artist is required to speak to a modern audience and be of their time. But it's interesting to point out one significant difference between these two works. The Barocci was painted in 1575, two years before Rubens was even born, and the Baciccio was painted in 1686, 131 years later. So stylistic categories are uh, often used today with tremendous conviction, but so often works defy them. Take also this masterpiece by Correggio, who Caracci loved, painted in 1528. It looks Baroque, and the historian's tendency towards stratification can suggest that merit credited to a certain work must be influenced according to the era in which it was created, and not by mastery, invention, or correct theological insight. But as it was so aptly stated by the Venerable Louise de Granada, merit springs from things, not the year in which it was crafted. Bernini, who was also a very astute observer of trends, uh, and he predicted that his work would fall out of favor, which it did toward the end of the French monarchy. Modernism, in many ways, has its roots in the European Enlightenment and its subjective philosophy. Deism became popular, which held that God was far away, and there is no spiritual revelation. In stark contrast to Bernini, they rejected organized religion and spiritual experience, and held that the observation of nature was sufficient without objective principle. A leading criticism, the Enlightenment concerning counter-reformation art, was the assertion that it appealed only to the senses and not to the intellect. This misses the mark as sacred art is not intended to be merely pedagogic, but to draw the viewer into communion with Christ. Cardinal Federico Borromeo in the late 17th century enlarges on this point. The piety of God and the saints, the praise, the imitation, the fear, the pain, and the hope are just the soul's feeling, feelings aroused by the sacred images. In fact, painting is a language painters speak not to men's ears, but to men's souls. St. Bellarmine likewise wrote in The Ascent of the Mind of God that the senses exist as a part of God's divine authorship and serve to draw us unto him. My soul, when anything that seems wonderful strikes your eye or your thought, make it a ladder to recognize the creator's perfection, which is incomparably greater and more wonderful. Perhaps for this reason, Bernini's Constantine here is one of the most loathed of his works by the Enlightenment thinkers. We are presented with the complete Christian experience, seeing Constantine wrapped with awe in his vision of the cross the light of Christ being an essential part of the composition, wholly influenced by San Filippo Neri's theatrical oratories. It should be noted that the common term Baroque was in fact a derogatory label coined in the 18th century and initially applied to music to express this disdain for what was deemed degenerate. Johann Sebastian Bach, Bach's, Bach's work fell into complete obscurity as the Enlightenment considered it too backward looking and religious rather than progressive. His children who were also outstanding composers in their own right went on to become much more famous than their father because of contemporary tastes. Thankfully, Felix Mendelssohn went to extensive lengths to find and preserve Bach's work. 
and succeeded in salvaging St. Matthew's passion, though two other passions have been lost forever. So where did this contempt against the counter-reform art lead? Some of you may have visited the Duomo of Orvieto. Here's an etching showing the interior with sculptures of the 12 apostles lying in the columns. And here you can see in the photo, they're gone. In 1897, these beautiful 16th to 17th century sculptures were removed by the academics and engineers named Paolo Zampi and Luigi Fumi. They called it a purist restoration in their own words to cancel the Baroque and render pure once again the austere simplicity of the Gothic interior. They were acting upon an arbitrary stylistic ideology that had nothing to do with theology or litur liturgical function, and this is shocking even by today's standards. The good news, however, is that mistakes can be fixed, and in 2019, after 122 years, they were put back. And this was widespread at the time. This is a uh, historic photo of the Duomo of Siena. Again, columns lined with the 12 apostles by the sculptor Giuseppe Mazzuoli, assistant of Bernini. They're gone now, removed in the 19th century and sold. Thankfully, they're in a church, so uh, the Brompton Oratory of London. In contrast to these purists, I would argue that with sound theology, there is great unity of faith and compatibility between the works of those various centuries who our ancestors attempt to emulate and apply classical principles for the worship of the Trinity and liturgical practice. Gothic may at times be a parody of classicism, but they didn't altogether abandon columns, capitals, and so on. Bernini even stated that a student would benefit from studying the ornament of the Duomo of Milan. The whole, maybe not so much, but the parts, yes. Take a look at the drapery on this beautiful sculpture of Christ from St. Chapelle in Paris. It may be Gothic, but looks kind of Baroque. Not too different from the 17th century. Out of the same spirit of unity, this is a sculpture of St. Michael I produced for St. Patrick's Church of New Orleans. My client specifically requested that we return to the iconography of Byzantium, such as we see in the mosaics from Ravenna, to pursue a synthesis of bold Western form with rich Eastern liturgical character. St. Michael is therefore clothed in formal court dress, including a jewel-encrusted loros, billowing silk mantle, chiton undergarment, and imperial red shoes, all of which signify the divine authority of his office. In his right hand, he holds the trisagium prayer in Greek and stands triumphantly upon the evil one whom he has subdued. The action is underlined by the Latin rendering of the Hebrew name Michael, quis ut deus, who is like God. Standing before the heavenly throne with his outstretched arm, St. Michael shows us the Volto Santo on a gold patent, reflecting the face of Christ, triumphant in glory. This is representative of the holy face of Christ from the Bicis burial cloth of Monopello, which was placed upon the face of Jesus at his entombment. All the work has been subordinate to, subordinated to this point of greatest prominence, centering the work in Christ. And from east to west, the Volto Santo image, whether it be from the two burial cloths or from the Vale of Veronica, has informed artists and bound them in faith. Just look at this beautiful face of our Lord by Bernini of the Redeemer, or this mosaic from the Agia Sophia. Regardless if it was intentional, this corpus by Bernini in Toronto, with the linear simplicity and angularity of the drapery, looks quite similar to this majestic crucifix by Cimabue, who was still very much a part of the Byzantine tradition. So what about modern iconoclasm and works that don't have theological coherence or unity? These are tiles by Matisse from the Rosary Chapel in Venice. And who is this and why doesn't he have a face? Were we made in the image and likeness of God? There are those who love to point out that the shiny tiles are meant to reflect your own face, thereby calling you to sanctity. But for crying out loud, the face is 15 feet off the ground. Are you supposed to bring a ladder? I guess not. It's metaphorical. But the Bolognese theologian and contemporary of Karachi, Cardinal uh, Gabriele Pagliotti, observed that artworks which are obscure and ambiguous will fail to illuminate the intellect and arouse devotion and heartfelt contrition. Instead, they will so confound the mind that it will be pulled in a thousand ways as it tries to make out what the figure before it is, while devotion drains away. This Madonna also looks a little off, and I've heard we're supposed to be childlike, but St. Paul also said we are no longer children swayed by the tides of influence. And my kids are also annoyed to see these in a chapel. The quote from the church doctor, St. Bellarmine, on the right, may seem obvious. God granted us two eyes, two ears, two hands, two feet, one nose, one mouth, one chest, one head, and the outcome was very beautiful and well proportioned. Is this isolated, or, and when does this, where does this modern iconoclasm lead? This is a corpus by Germain Richier from Our Lady Full of Grace of Plateau d'Assi, consecrated in 1950. 
also faces like the Matisse. So theology goes out the window and ideology runs amok. After considering these similarities between the Gothic and the Baroque and Byzantine, you'd be hard pressed to find similarity between this piece and any work from tradition. I do see similarity though between this and the modern push to change the traditional definition of marriage and gender and pronoun ideology. And with regard to prayer and liturgy, it also begs the question, is this evangelical? Does it bring us closer to God? Cardinal Pagliotti would say no, and wrote, the dignity, importance, and utility of sacred images have been demonstrated, yet so perverse is the malice of the demon, the enemy of all virtue, that when he's unable to get rid of a praiseworthy and holy usage altogether, he falls back on causing us to abuse it, so that it does us no good. He tries to wrest the sword from our hands, and when he sees that he cannot do so, he strives at any rate to blunt its edge, or to make us wield it in such a way that it injures us, not our opponent. Very powerful words and very relevant to our time. Now this is the Termini, Roma Termini rail station before and after. It was torn down and replaced with a trendy, well-lit cantilever architecture. And this is another very well-suited premonition from the 17th century historian Giovanni Bellori. Alas, in the fall of the Roman Empire, with which all of the fine arts decline, among them architecture, more than others because of the barbarian builders, Romante, Raphael, and Michelangelo labored to restore architecture from its historic ruin, selecting the most elegant form of ancient buildings. But today, instead of receiving thanks, they are reviled with the ancients, as if the former had copied the latter without genius and invention. Consequently, the individual makes up in his own head a new idea, devoid of every science in the domain of architecture. They fabricate nonsense of angles, broken, elevant, broken elements, and distortion of lines, deforming buildings in, very, in the very cities. This really sounds like a critique of our own time. Uh, and despite the efforts of the mo modern barbarians to stop classicism, why does it still endure? And why has it been so well suited to count countless religions and cultures for so many centuries? Classical Greco-Roman and Christian architecture isn't isolated among pagans and Christians of Europe. This t ancient temple of the Nabataeans from a pre-Muslim Arab culture in modern day Jordan is marvelous and it enchants us to this day. Look at this detail from Petra centuries before they were conquered by the Romans. In the ancient city of Palmyra, in Syria, we see a, a unique use of the formal classical orders in this Semitic temple of Bel Samin, destroyed by Isis. This is the profound effect of a universal language in the context of another culture, religion, and society, both timeless and relevant. Take also the Hagia Sophia of Constantinople in present-day Istanbul built in the 6th century and described by St. Ag Agathias as being technically daring, perfect in harmony, marvelous and terrifying. When the city was sacked by the young Mehmet II in 1453, they destroyed and looted the city for three days, killing countless Christians. When he arrived at the Hagia Sophia, he prevented his troops from destroying the structure and proclaimed his famous lines, be satisfied with the takings and the captives, but this structure is for a law. So clearly the classical language can even be relevant to the Muslims. However, if Mehmet II encountered the Richard Meyer White Church, would he say the same thing? Probably not. This all seems to, contra to, to contradict the argument today that classical art and architecture are out of touch, hard to understand, elitist, that it doesn't reflect our time. This implies that the great works of the past no longer have the power to move us and inspire, which as an academic ideology can be turned into arbitrary do's and don'ts confusing young people. This is wrong and there should be encouragement to understand why the masters of the past thought and worked the way they did, rather than being mandated that we can no longer work this way. As an instructor, I always felt that if students were treated like children, then they themselves would act like children. But if they were treated like advanced adults who can think for themselves, then they would progress much more quickly. Likewise, if we were treated as though we were intelligent and deserving of the highest form of beauty, then people will feel appreciated and become more civilized and intelligent. And that vain beauty rooted in truth is also evangelical and enduring. We should seek to elevate society out of the mundane and into communion with Christ as preparation for the heavenly Jerusalem. Thankfully, there's a resurgence in, of classicism in the, in the United States. And I've had the wonderful blessing to work with many architects, including Duncan Stroik, whom we should admire for his devotion to Christ and this classical revitalization. Here are a few images from Duncan's restoration of St. Joseph's Cathedral in Sioux Falls. Uh, in which I'm humbled to have participated. I produced about 20 sculptures, including the bronze corpus here, the Baldacchino angels, various altar models. There's an ambo relief, there's a pediment tympanum for the cathedra. Architecture is remarkable. This is St. Augustine Cathedral in Kalamazoo, Michigan.
the renovated sanctuary by Duncan demonstrates successfully a Gothic and classical co compatibility. I produced the sculptures of St. Peter and Paul. Paul, prior to his conversion, had killed Christians, and he himself was beheaded, which is why he is depicted with a sword. He was a tough cookie and also worked with his hands, building tents in Corinth. Uh, St. Peter was also capable of violence and cut off the ear of Malchus, so I hope to depict them as rough saints who, through their conversion, did great things for God. These are new bronze doors, uh, which were also designed by Duncan for a Carmelite Basilica of Holy Hill, with reliefs depicting in Wisconsin, and the reliefs are depicting the transliteration of St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross, and here's Bishop Listecki blessing the doors with the Annunciation, one of the Annunciation panels. Much thanks is owed to Reverend Richard Hermes for all of his wonderful work as president of the Jesuit High School of Tampa. Upon his initiative, a marvelous new chapel was constructed from the ground up for which it was an honor to produce several works. Here is St. Ignatius and St. Francis Xavier for the, from the facade. Their gestures are meant to convey their missionary zeal. And St. Francis Xavier is thought to have baptized close to a million souls all over the world. Matthew and Luke from the four evangelists. Here is the sanctuary and St. Joseph with the Christ child who looks up with loving abandon, alluding to his offering and sacrifice. This is one of the 14 Stations of the Cross and a polychrome sacristy crucifix. This is a marble corpus carved from one block of marble on an African granite uh, cross, and the cloister is all new, and this is in Traverse City. This is another bronze corpus for another Jesuit high school in Houston, and I collaborated with Jackson Ryan Architects, a wonderful firm. These are two station samples from St. Therese of, of Deep Haven, Minnesota. It was a pleasure to work with Father Leonard Andre, who was very much interested in having classical uh, figurative work to contrast the modern structure in which they were placed. I tried to include the classical orders uh, when possible. Here the Doric reinforces the austere gesture of the centurion ordering Simon to help Jesus. This is in progress right now in the studio. This is St. Teresa of Lisieux and St. Louis Mar Martin for a new chapel in Chicago by architect Tom Ra Rajkovic. Um, given the amount of historical photographs, again, I studied their physiognomy and tried to best achieve a likeness. The necessity of idealization is not always an objective rule, but can be determined by the subject. Uh, he's also shown in contemporary dress, so, and hopefully that this illustrates the versatility and compatibility of the classical canon even when depicting saints of our own time. I've also done a handful of works in Europe, but the classical renewal isn't as widespread in the United States. This is a drawing of St. Teresa of Calcutta for the Bishop of Tirana, Albania. His, ex His Excellency uh, Monsignor Dodage is a fun composition, again, a, of a contemporary saint. This work is in Rome of St. Escrivan Beato Alvaro in a beige stone from Aquila uh, with my smaller plaster model. In this piece, I insisted the work have a liturgical character, showing them with a chasuble and prayer given the placement next to a tabernacle. These are alabaster reliefs produced with a company called Granda. This was for the Clinica Universidad de Nevada in Madrid and depicts a visitation, three trinities, and St. Escriba with Beato Isidore Zorzano. For these pieces, I employed students uh, and with a stipend to help with the models. And the chapel is somewhat utilitarian, though they were enthusiastic that I, th I designed classical figures with scenes also including classical orders. For the visitation, actually, one of the students who I hired was Kate Marin, who's an alumni of Benedictine, who's also my student in Florence. She did a wonderful bronze group here. This is St. Emidio baptizing Policia. This was done for the historic Cathedral Foligno, uh, which is by the architect Luigi Van Vitelli. This is over 14 feet tall and was commissioned by the Cardinal of Florence for his home cathedral to replace a different sculpture of the same saint that was destroyed during World War II. Now, regarding the construction of new churches, an interesting statistic in Italy is that the number being built annually from the ground up at least 10 years ago was about 30 to 40 for the entire country. And this isn't too bad. All the plans go through the Italian Episcopal Conference, and 80% of the funds come from the state. But none of these new churches since the 1950s are even remotely classical. Zero. Absolutely none. So you may hear a lot of words being thrown around about dialogue, but classical architecture is largely forbidden in most of Europe. So the dialogue would appear to be over, though with the figure, there may be a bit more tolerance, usually of producing conformity to contemporary ideology. 
Another recent statistic reveals that one in five Italians go to any kind of church weekly. That's 18% of the population dropping. And here's one more statistic that just came out. Italy and Spain have the lowest birth rates in all of Europe, lower than Japan, which is unbelievable. And this has become another new cultural norm. So what is the connection? In the past, a faithful, virile society produced beautiful churches and had big families. Now a modern society, which is sterile, that doesn't have many families and produces ugly architectures and the churches are empty. So I would say that it could be argued that modernism isn't working. Uh, I would say if the church hierarchy would like to re-Christianize Europe, they should stick tradi to, to tradition and encourage marriage and lots of kids like they do in Kansas here. Americans also have skin in the game with what goes on in Italy. By act of Congress, we rebuilt the country to stop the spread of communism. It was called the Marshall Plan. It didn't work very well, but we tried. But in spite of all the depressing news, along with the bad things that are being said about the United States, we are so blessed to be Americans, and this is still the greatest country on the planet. We have freedom, variety. The country still has c Christian character. Uh, Catholics still have very large families. Uh, take it from someone who has lived in Europe for 20 years. Please cherish this country and question modernist platitudes when you hear them. Procedure, traditional production, and the use of technology. Now, we touched a little bit on the theological content, but how about the actual technical procedure? I studied at the Florence Academy, which is a private traditional figurative art school founded by Daniel Graves and based upon the Ecole de Beaux-Arts of the 19th century. Their pro approach is figurative uh, from observation of a live model, no photographs, all in natural life. All, all in natural light. Here's a figure study I did as a teacher as a demonstration of the drawing, which I composed as a penitent Magdalene. And this is another figure study that I did in clay, which was the basis for a drapery arrangement. While state schools are typically modernist, there are a few good traditional schools like the Florence Academy, and a program is usually three years, which helps develop a visual vocabulary and a good grasp of anatomy. There is, however, one large gap in education when it comes to the study of drapery and application of the figure. Three years may seem like a lot, but the Ecole de Beaux-Arts was actually at least a five-year program, and drapery was an important part of the curriculum. I pursue this area of study and have tried to transmit what I can to students. This is an example of a beginning exercise that I arranged for one of my students, Riley Root, who did a wonderful job on the clay. Procedurally, the method par excellence is the School of Raphael, which was continued by the Karachi and the French Academy. We see here the studies for the transfiguration in red by Raphael. Uh, and figure studies by Baciccio of Zechariah, figure and drapery studies. Following their method is St. Luke from my, oh, sorry, this is Cubis de Chavon as well, from the 19th century, La Repose, beautiful, beautiful work. Following their method is St. Luke from my four evangelists. Uh, the arrangement gives priority to the essential movements and, and twists while finding additional contrasting angles in a linear gesture. This is a marble relief I made for a church in Palermo with architect Ciro Lamonte depicting the sacrifice of Isaac. A trick from the past was to take gravity out of the equation or use gravity to your advantage when arranging fabric, allowing the folds to be shaped and molded with ease. Here again are contrasting angles, zigzags to balance and complement the curvature through the figure. I used to find a repetition of Schubert unsettling, but in sculpture can be, it can create a greater impact when a movement is recapitulated. And forgive me also for being so repetitious and redundant tonight. Going back to the Angel of Fatima, which is not a routine conventional arrangement, my process is piecemeal. I'll select parts, arrange them spontaneously with photography. A handful can easily become a hundred or a thousand, and I put them together as a drawing, such as this one of Ave Regina Pachis, to develop a coherent composition. Photogra photography is two-dimensional, and the figure is three-dimensional, so I don't advocate the use of photography for the fi figure or, or portraiture, as it puts a barrier between the artist and their subject. Uh, drapery, it, for drapery photography, on the other hand, is quite useful, because an artist is no longer committed to an, a one mannequin arrangement, and can look for more variety and spontaneity in the folds. With regard to the final material, about three-quarters of my work is marble. For a monumental piece, I'll develop a small scale model at about one third to one half the final scale. This is shown in these images here, the small scale with the, with the larger marble works. Uh, working at a reduced size allows for flexibility while focusing upon the essential characteristics. From there, the model is scanned and I'll make a digital copy. Um, here is the scan of the Fatima group along with the relief for Palermo. 
this can reveal certain errors, such as if one of the hands is too small, which can easily be adjusted. These angels I produced uh, with architect David Napolitano for the Benedictine, Benedictine Monastery of Norcia are also shown in this mock-up scan, uh, which was done to sh make sure the scale was correct and that they follow the curvature of the wall. So it's very useful for that sort of, if there's a context in which there's any question whether or not they'll fit. From the scan, we develop a program to determine how the machine will negotiate the undercuts, ensuring removal will not damage the material. Uh, one bump from the robotic arm can break off marble. The spinning diamond router goes down to about a half an inch, and I intentionally leave excess material to prevent the stone from being cooked, which also allows more room for development by hand. And these images show the machine roughing out the general form. Now, there's a misconception that hand carving has been completely eliminated and the robot finishes everything, but that is not the case at all. This is the head of the Angel of Fatima as it was left by the machine. And here I've carved into the depth of the hair and found the features. Uh, the machine really just leaves an undefined mass and the rest is done with traditional chisels. Historically, carvers, including Michelangelo, typically approach marble with a great deal of preparation. It is well documented that many of Bernini and Michelangelo's works were also enlarged by assistants from smaller sketches after which much of the finer development was done with models of parts such as the face mass and hands. This way the marble was a unique work rather than a one-to-one -one copy by an artisan. I've likewise tried to emulate this process by starting with a smaller model and producing the full-size models as references for the areas which are more generalized, such as the face of the child Jesus as shown here. In, not, in a nutshell, I would say the procedure is actually still quite similar to the, to the one in the, to what they did in the 17th century. The major difference being that the modern equipment does the remedial grunt work in the initial stage rather than a studio assistant. Some also say the machine is taking away carving jobs. On the contrary, I would say it encourages the artists to hone their skills for finer carving, elevating their craft. In pursuit of harmonious proportions and beauty, tools are a means to this end, and I see no problem looking at the equipment available for the best possible result. Many advancements are a great logistical advantage to sculpture. Even when it comes to you know, banal things like transportation, whereas compared to, say, painting, you know, which hasn't benefited so much from a lot of the advancements. The introduction of machines also isn't even new. This is a Colas pont pantograph, which was used ex extensively by Rodin, and there was a hydraulic version which could even be used to carve soft materials such as alabaster all the way back in the mid-1800s. It was all just geometry. Even with modern advancements, though, any one of these phases can lead to catastrophic error. Uh, for Ave Regina Pachis, the point was incorrectly calibrated, and after a month under the machine, it broke off the nose of the ch a child Jesus, it broke off Our Lady's fingers and toes. We had to throw the whole entire block away and start over. As, and at the end of the day, regardless of the process, if the work looks terrible, the buck certainly stops with me. Well, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. Uh, it's such a pleasure. And if you have any questions, we can do some Q&A now. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Um, you showed us an image of, uh, I think it was a relief, uh, Sant'Agostino in Rome, maybe? I can't remember. It went by fairly quickly. It was, uh, it was Mary and Anne, I believe. Uh-huh. Um, it reminded me of a sculpture of Teresa of Calcutta in the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in D.C. Okay. And then you showed us a drawing of Teresa of Calcutta. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I was just curious, could you talk a little bit more about the naturalism of the Anne and the, San, is it the Sant'Agostino that it's in? Um, Sant'Agostino, yes. It's a work by Andrea Sansovino. He was a pupil of Michelangelo. Yeah. Well, I, I'm surprised to see it in that context because when I walk by the Teresa in D.C., that, that uh, what do you call it, naturalism as opposed to idealism, uh -huh. um, it, it seems less surprising. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that Anne fits in that place, I mean, is it, or is it just, is it just well, me? Yeah, that, well, that's a very interesting question. Um, surprisingly, in that 
sculpture, the, the Madonna is very idealized. I mean, she looks, it looks as though it was carved by Phidias or something in the fifth century and the, and the other, uh, the elderly face was much, much more naturalistic. So maybe he was trying, and I don't know this, but maybe he was trying to uh, theologically emphasize the uh, preservation from original sin in, the, in Our Lady. I mean, that would be my assumption. But I would say the naturalism is something that could be determined by the subject. So he, for us, you know, an image of St. Teresa of Calcutta, it may seem inappropriate to produce a, a highly idealized, uh, you know, image, you know, given that we're so, she's so recognizable. That would be my interpretation of it, at least. Could you talk a little bit more about um, the re like or like the connection between even in the Great Church, like the precedent? Well, in in that case, I mean, it was really the the drawing, the design, the the iconography, the way the drapery. I mean, the drapery was was certainly drawn that way in the mosaic for theological reasons. So I was looking at the theological connection. I mean, I think that in in ancient mosaics in the early church, there's so, so much that we can learn from them. And, and it's just there's such a wealth of, of, of just of variety and, and richness and there's just so much content there that, you know, it's always very useful to go back and look at that. And I think that they were doing that in the 17th century. I mean, we have a lot of documentation. We know what they were looking at when they were doing it. I was familiar with these things as well. But I, I certainly try to look at the, at the Byzantines and try to find as much common ground as possible. So, so how long does it take, um, let's say the statue in front of us, how long does that take from conception to the final chisel mark that you make or the final polishing? Um, in, by average, what would you say how long would it take using the robotic arm? Uh -huh. By average, well, uh, you know, the machine hasn't really sped things up that much. A lot of people think that the machines are used to save money and to work more quickly. The, it actually costs about the same, and I would say for, for me, for my process, it's about the same length of time. But for, on average, for a piece like this, and these are complicated, there's a lot of undercuts, the block went all the way out to the ed edge of the profile and the architecture there on the base. So it was a huge block of marble, and the machine goes right into that block. So this is about a month under the machine, and that's from seven in the morning until seven at night. And then the hand carving for that particular piece, I probably worked about five or six weeks, 10, 10 hours a day, six days a week. That would typically be what goes into that. So there's still a lot of work that's done by hand. For the Angel of Fatima, we were working in two in tandem, and that was, and that was working minute by minute, and that, and that was a month and a half. Oh, uh, I would say from drawing to model to finish, I, w I would say eight months, eight months. I was hoping to play the devil's advocate just a little bit. Um, how do you feel about um, Anthony Gaudi's uh, Sagrada Familia? A lot of people consider it a magnificent, you know, inspiring, uh, elevating work, but it's very modernist. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's part A. Is it modernist? I, you know, I I I, I tend to avoid Gaudi. It always sends ah. up red flags whenever I hear Gaudi. But I mean, you've spent time you spent time in Barcelona looking at it. Right? I, I haven't actually. I haven't. I, I really haven't studied it very much. But I, I you know I find him as a person interesting. You know, he was very temperamental and he lived in the church and uh, you know he had his own views. He was very single minded. Uh, I I mean it, it's certainly goth, neo gothic. You know the English really don't like Gaudi very much. A lot of very colorful criticism from the English on Gaudi. Well, that's their problem, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I appreciate the fact, I mean, people find it beautiful and it's inspiring. I mean, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, do the, uh, do the students know it? On, you know, on one side of it is the crucifixion and then on the other side is the resurrection scene. Mm -hmm. And on the crucifixion side, he intentionally uses cubist style, like Picasso style, clunky, faceless creatures. Well, but hold on a second, though. That was done in the 70s, so that, that wasn't Gaudi. That wasn't what he intended. That wasn't his vision. No, no, that's, that's important, because the works that were done in his lifetime were much more naturalistic. They were much more classical and refined. 
Well, the the Easter side does become more naturalistic and idealized, and it always seemed to me actually um, kind of powerful sort of, you know, um, reverse procedure through art history, but at least in the, in the, in the scene of sort of like trying to e evoke a type of effective spirituality, the crucifixion, uh, s the crucifixion um, side seemingly does it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Anyway, I guess I'm, my other sort of question was, I'm just wondering, are, are you more, uh, have you benefited more from modernism than, than you're telling us, Mr. Swanson? In which, I mean, um, I see, I can sort of, you know, trace lots of interesting kind of, you know, vocabulary pieces in your, in your wonderful works. You've got at least something of kind of a Byzantine or medieval strand, which really emphasizes this kind of, this sacred, right, what we could call the numinous quality, right? Uh -huh. The holiness of holiness, right? You have some very, your, some of the angels have very large sort of uh, fearsome eyes, which I think is wonderful, very sort of medieval Byzantine technique. You have some, you have some figures which are very naturalistic, especially in your 19th century uh, uh, um, saints. And then you have some, Our, Our Lady looks like a, like a Botticelli, her face is like Julia Roberts or something, you know, um, essentially perfect uh, form. But it, se it seems to me that that's the gift of modernity, right? Um, sure. No, absolutely. Yeah. I see so you're a postmodern classicist? I, I suppose. I mean, going back to stratification, I, I don't know how, how to put that in a box, but um, I, I would say that, um, sure, I mean, you know, I've, I've gone through a conversion uh, my, of my own. I, I was a Protestant, and, and the work I produced when I first started sculpting isn't how I produce work now, but, but, but um, yeah, I, I would say that we benefit a lot from modernism in that regard today. I mean, we have options. I think that, um, I, I mean, I'm certainly not trying to tell anybody what they can or can't do and that they should do this and that this is the, the best way to do things. I mean, I even, I like many paintings by Matisse. I think that in that particular piece, it, promoting that would be uh, a disservice to the church because there's theological error there. So I was looking at the theological discontinuity. Um, but, um, you know, certainly other paintings by his are quite beautiful. Um, but, uh, no, I would say that it's it's interesting. I, it, un, unfortunately, now there's a lot of people that that are saying that you can't do the classicism. And I think most of the classicists just want to be left alone. They just want to be <laughs> allowed to do what they want to do. And you know, we're not saying that you should stop producing other kinds of work. But so, um, with regard to sculpture in general, I've found there's this so. Considering that uh, sculpture of antiquity was typically in its time painted, um, but over time the paint is worn away, uh -huh. in the modern mind that tends to create this sort of falsely founded association between unpainted sculpture and a sort of elegance or sophistication. Um, what, would, what would be your thoughts on that? Well, um, you know, I don't think that in the 17th century they weren't aware of the fact that sculptures were painted. That's a concept that's promoted now that they didn't know that they were painted. That's a recent discovery. And there are all kinds of works that were discovered at that time which have traces of painting as well. I think it was a, an aesthetic decision. Uh, and, you know, to say that works weren't painted in the 17th century, they used a variety of different marbles. Uh, they used a variety of different marbles in architecture, which sort of resembles painted architecture. So I think that it was continued in that regard. So um, I, I don't think that there's anything missing in a sculpture that's not painted. It was continued in polychrome sculpture was continued in the Spanish tradition quite a lot with the uh, wood carving, not, not so much with marble. I, do, I don't see any, I don't see really any, um, what would you say, uh, 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 incompatibility between the two. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.